So why not make the friend and take the friendship and make it awkward? This episode is sponsored by Rackspace. Are you looking for a place to host your latest creation? Want terrific support, high performance, all backed by the largest open source cloud? What if you could try it for free? Try out Rackspace at rubyrogues.com slash Rackspace and get a $300 credit over six months. That's $50 per month at rubyrogues.com slash Rackspace. This episode is sponsored by Codeship.io. Don't you wish you could simply deploy your code every time your test passed? Wouldn't it be nice if it were tied into a nice continuous integration system? That's Codeship. They run your code. If all your tests pass, they deploy your code automatically for fuss-free continuous delivery. Check them out at Codeship.io. Continuous delivery made simple. This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a 1,000 tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and L.A. bid on Ruby developers, providing them with salary and equity up front. The average Ruby developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary offer of $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they also give you a $2,000 signing bonus as a thank you for using them. But if you use the Ruby Rogues link, you'll get a $4,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hired and get a $1,337 bonus if they accept a job. Go sign up at Hired.com slash Ruby Rogues Podcast. Snap is a hosted CI and continuous delivery that is simple and intuitive. Snap's deployment pipelines deliver fast feedback and can push healthy builds to multiple environments automatically or on demand. Snap integrates deeply with GitHub and has great support for different languages, data stores, and testing frameworks. Snap deploys your application to cloud services like Heroku, DigitalOcean, AWS, and many more. Try Snap for free. Sign up at snapci.com slash rubyrogues. Hey everybody and welcome to episode 177 of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel we have Saranya Bark. Hey everybody. Avdi Grimm. Hello, hello. David Brady. If I had a prep joke ready thing, grammar, shut up! I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv and uh, this week we're going to be talking about creativity and technology. This is something that I've kind of been thinking about a lot and I've talked to Saran a couple of times about. I'm kind of curious before we get too deep into this, do you guys have uh, creative outlets or ventures that you participate in outside of programming? I love watching Saran draw comics. Wait, you've watched me draw comics? <laughs> oh, I probably shouldn't have told that. <laughs> wow. I was going to say, if she doesn't know about it, um, <clears throat> never mind. I'll put you in touch with my lawyer. He's got a standard restraining form. He just rubber stamps it. it it's just easier <laughs> for my lawyer to just give them out. Great. I look forward to it. <laughs> it sounds like you got pretty creative in order to be able to do that. I probably shouldn't comment. I'm really close to the, the restraining orders being turned into a class action lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> I like how somehow I've turned into the creepy guy on the show. <laughs> so quickly, in like the first and, 30 seconds, too. And and that I did it to myself. I was going to say, you had very little help. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see that now. <laughs> yeah, so we can talk about cartooning. You guys want to start there? Sure. Okay, so I feel really bad about this, and I feel like I'm going to crush all of your dreams right now, because I really don't see cartooning as a creative outlet at all. Um, I see it as a means to an end. Usually when I cartoon, it's with a purpose, and I really don't like drawing for the sake of drawing, which is why I actually don't draw very often if it's not for a blog post or to explain a tech concept or, you know, for some bigger purpose. I actually don't draw for the sake of drawing. I feel like I need to apologize for that. This is the sound of my dreams dying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I mean, growing up, I was always doodling on something. And, you know, it wasn't necessarily for any purpose, and it wasn't necessarily necessarily not for any purpose, but it was just something that I did. And that kind of morphed into writing, and writing has kind of become that creative outlet. And sometimes I do write just to write. Does it have to be for no particular reason in order to be creative, though? That's a good point. I don't know. I feel like when people talk about creativity, it's usually, you know, you made this and it's creative, and as long as it is interesting, then A+. Plus. And for me, I feel like when you do something creative, it being creative or it being interesting is kind of the bare minimum. 
Like, I feel like it should do more than that, right? So I feel like I've made something creative successfully if it also connected with you, right? If it caused an emotional response with you or if it explained something to you or if it made something, you know, interesting or, you know, you know what I mean? Like, if it does that, then I feel like I've done a good job. But if it just stops at, oh, this is something interesting and doesn't do more, then I just don't feel satisfied. Do you play a musical instrument? I pretend to play the piano. Mm. And when you play the piano, I mean, is is that for any particular purpose or? It makes me feel really smart. So I play like the one song that I know over and over again. But that's probably why I don't play the <laughs> piano very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and see, to me, that also, you know, doesn't necessarily serve a major purpose, but it engages you in a different way. That's kind of what I wanted to talk about with this topic. And I know there are other aspects of it as well, but whether or not it has a purpose, you know, I, I definitely see that, you know, it makes you feel really smart. And I think that is just as important sometimes. Well, and I have to wonder if getting your creative juices flowing is not necessarily the same thing as relaxing. I talked about the book On Becoming a Writer by Dorothea Brand. I may have even picked it. It's, it's an older book about writing. And she talks about learning what your poisons are. And what she means by this is writers will find things that inspire them and they will find things that just fill them with despair. Like there's one author that literally makes me suicidal to read his work. And there's another author that is, he's so good that whenever I read his stuff, I'm just like, I will never ever write. I am an insult to the written word. And I love reading both of their writings, but I have to be aware of the damage that they do to me. And Dorothea Brand actually points this out. She says, what you love and what inspires you might not be the same thing. And even what you like might not be. And so there are people that write science fiction that don't like reading <laughs> science, which is awesome, but they'll go out and one person said that she would sit down and crack open like an organic chemistry book and just read molecule names and it would just make her eyeballs hurt. And then when she was done, after like 45 minutes of that, her brain was like, oh my gosh, I am so filled with factoids. I can't wait to go write. And she was completely filled with inspiration. She wanted to go write. She would run to the, to the, this is an old book, to the typewriter and just start cranking out manuscript pages of science fiction. And the point of this is that maybe what you like to go do isn't necessarily what gets your creative juices flowing. I, I love playing video games, for example. They're, they're taking up a lot of my time right now, and I'll explain why Avdi's to blame for that in the picks. But they don't get me creatively motivated. They are a relaxation. I, I do them to take care of like burnout and stress. But they don't get me excited to go write a new you know, linked list processor. That was a long ramble. I sort of kind of circled the point there at the end, but I don't know if I actually made the point. <laughs> My point is that creativity and relaxation might not necessarily be the same thing. Maybe things that we do that are creative can actually be very stressful and strenuous while we're doing them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, a lot of the things that I do to relax are pretty mind-numbing. And so it doesn't really add to the creativity. But then there are other things, you know, and for me in particular, it really is writing fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, it just fires up the creativity. The other thing that really fires up the creativity, I don't know why I go figure this one out, is going for a run. I go, I go for a run for an hour, and I come back, and I am good to go for hours on end. I love that you write fiction to relax. I hate opening up a project repo and finding out that you have written 2,000 words of fiction beginning with required Nokogiri class application. <laughs> So I'm kind of curious with, with these creative endeavors or things that kind of amp up your creativity, do they help with coding? Do you find that there's crossover between them? I've kind of been surprised at how I don't feel like there is. And I'm wondering if that's because I've only been coding for a little over a year and maybe that time will come. But, you know, I was most excited about coding from the perspective of, great, now I can take this and I can come up with all these ideas and, you know, spin them into apps and... I feel like the creative part of that is still not within reach quite yet. I still like I feel, I feel like I'm still figuring out like the the technical parts and trying to understand the right ways to do things or the like, best practices and all that. And I feel like at least with drawing, right? I think that when you 
first start to draw, you have to know just how to do stuff. And then once you know how to do stuff and you have the right technique, then you can, you know, do things that are more creative and think outside the box. But you have to kind of get the best practices down first. And so I feel like when it comes to coding, I'm still in the understand the best practices place. And I haven't yet transitioned into, okay, now I can think a little bit outside the box and make this my own. I think I kind of agree that like when I draw or when I play guitar or when I do other things, I don't really think that helps my coding. Like if I want to work on my coding, I'll go do, you know, exorcism or I'll go do a code kata. But like playing guitar, you can shift notes from one note to another with what's called hammering. Like you can hammer on a note and hammer off a note. And it sounds really cool. It's just this, you know, the, the notes just kind of shift up and down. And it's because you're not strumming the, the, the keys or the, you're strumming the keys. I, I'm really bad. <laughs> I'm really bad at guitar. I don't, it's, you know, anyway, so you grab it by the fretboard. That actually is a thing on a guitar. And when you hammer on a note, what you do is you put your finger on the string so hard that it, actually rings the string and so you can actually hear the note and so you can actually play a guitar just by tapping on the fretboard what does this have to do with programming well if you read the sheet music for this the notes for when you're hammering they have little lines drawn over the top of them to indicate ligatures between the notes and the ligature is from the latin word meaning binding or tie and it just shows that these notes are tied together in a certain way and it was after playing music casually for 10 years or so that I started to notice that there are different ways that you can tie code together. And I started talking about code ligatures and I would talk about this module has some ligatures to this module or let's, let's review the ligatures of the entire application. And anybody that does music immediately knows what I mean. They're, they know that I'm talking about how deeply coupled things are and how easily decouplable they are. And it's a, it's not just clean, precise modularity versus cohesion. It's this fluid, creative concept about how things are tied together. And that all comes from music. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. My point is, is that when you go off and do these crazy, weird, creative things, sometimes you come back with, not things that influence your code directly, but that influence your high-level code in a really weird and kind of orthogonal way. In my experience, pretty much anything that really takes my mind off uh, the code is kind of essential to being more creative once I get back to coding. You know, it's really just about letting the unconscious mind work for a while um, without the conscious mind getting in the way. Yeah, one other thing that I have found is that uh, not just the common language that David's talking about, but in a lot of cases, so some of my other things that I like to do is I like to work on things and build things. And so, like, I'll go work on my car or I, I've done some woodworking in the past. So when I come to a problem, sometimes I'll be looking at it and I'll be trying to figure it out. And then I have a mental model of how a certain part of a car engine works or a mental model of how I would do something, you know, with different woodworking practices. So this is similar to what David was saying, except I go in and I solve the problem instead of recognizing a pattern that's already in the code. And so I create my own pattern based on these other things that I'm experiencing from this other pursuit that I have. That's interesting because when I first started to learn to code, I found that to be very frustrating because when I write or when I draw or when I do any of those more creative things, I start with this final picture in mind, right? Like, even if I don't know how many paragraphs I'm going to have, I have an idea of the point I want to make. I have an idea of how I want the reader to feel at the end of reading, you know, the blog post or the story or whatever it is. And I have kind of this pattern, this final image in mind. And the hardest part for me about coding was that I never, I, I just didn't have that final image, right? I didn't know what the app should feel like or should act like or should, you know, look like because, you know, I was so new. And I found that to be very, very painful. And, you know, over time, once I got used to it, then I could kind of see how the features would work and how things would, you know, wire up and, and how it would, it would work together. But not having that immediate... You know, when you get used to creating things out of a vision and then you start to code and you can't get to that vision because you just don't have the experience, I found that to be very painful. Yeah, that's one thing that I've, I've definitely seen with TDD 
is that it at least gives me that vision. Not necessarily how all the pieces are going to stick together, but it gives me the big picture of, I'm going to put this in, I'm going to get this back out. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And that's one of the reasons why I really, really, like once I found testing and I used that as a process for coding, it helped so much exactly for that reason. Because now, even though I don't know exactly what methods I'm going to use and how it's going to work, I knew what it should feel like at the very end. And that made everything just a lot more focused and felt very purposeful. Yeah. The other thing that's interesting related to what you were saying is that, you know, with a blog post or a program, a lot of times there's kind of a story arc to it, kind of like with a musical piece, you know, there are different movements within it. And so being able to tell the story, being able to articulate how all of the different actors within your system are going to collaborate is a skill that I've seen different people pull out of the different creative pursuits that they have, whether it's you know, music where there's this underlying rhythm or um, different, you know, ways of, you know, expressing the note or, you know, people who write. And this is something that I really identify with, you know, where you create this story, you create almost a plot for your program to follow. And it's really interesting to see how different people formulate that based upon what they're doing to uh, stimulate their creativity, whether it's writing or drawing or playing music or even just reading or listening to music. It, it, you know, I, I find that very uh, interesting. And a lot of people, they try and segregate those parts of their brains. And when they bring that back into their process is when they really come up with the solution that is both elegant and understandable. I think it's important, again, to take these patterns that you find and actually let them kind of inform the high level of code. You were talking about writing fiction, and there's a fun rule of thumb in fiction that basically goes, figure out what kind of story you're telling. Are you telling, you know, like a milieu story? Or are you telling an idea story? Are you telling a character-based story? If you start one type of story, make sure you finish that type of story, right? I mean, it's like Lord of the Rings was an event story. There was a big bad thing that happened that messed up the whole world. And if Frodo had gotten to Mordor and then decided that what he really wanted to do was become a ballerina in the elf chorus and left the ring on the edge of the volcano and walked away, that would be a really weird ending. And that's because that's a character ending to an event story and they don't match up. And I actually proposed a talk a few years back that called what what we can learn about coding from writing fiction and no conference in its right mind accepted it and uh, I can't blame them really but the point that I, that I was trying to make was that if you start code in one style stay in that style if you're starting very functional fp code don't switch to procedural stateful code halfway through the class you know, if you've got a read, update, and delete method on your class, you're missing the create method, and everyone is going to expect it to be there. And so you need to put that in there. And it seems obvious once you somebody says, hey, you know, you've started this API, you need to finish this API. But it's all it is is an extension of the principle of least surprise, and that is that I've started telling you one type of story in this code file, at the end of the code file, I'm going to expect you to expect the ending to end the right way. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. I really like that. I kind of want to change tactics a little bit and uh, talk about one other thing that I use the kind of my creative pursuits for, and that is that sometimes, like, I don't feel like sitting down and writing code. I know you're all shocked, right? Mm -hmm. This dude is human too, okay? So <laughs> sometimes, you know, I just don't. I know I want to get the work done. And I know that I'll enjoy the process of getting the work done, but just getting started is hard. And so a lot of times I will do these other things. And so, you know, I'll go work on the car for a half hour if it needs it, mm -hmm. you know, or I'll, I'll sit down and I'll, I'll write a short story for a half hour, an hour, or, you know, I'll write the next section in a story that I'm working on, or I'll just sit down and, you know, doodle on some paper. And a lot of times that kind of gets me through whatever it is that, it's putting that wall up and, uh, you know, engages the different pieces of my brain that I need to start working on the code. And so then I can start, you know, poking at the code and pretty soon I'm fully engaged in writing code. Do you guys experience anything like that? 
Yeah, I mean, for me, most of my coding these days are for the Code Newbie website, and so I'm doing like the mockups and the design and the front end and the back end and all that. And my creative outlet, you know, when I don't want to just you know make a, a new feature directly, is I'll spend some time thinking about the design, or I'll spend some time thinking about the colors, or you know, I'll spend some time you know writing a blog post for the website and kind of being involved and touching on the product and focusing way more on things that are more creative until I kind of get in the right rhythm. And then I'm like, okay, let's go and actually code now. There's a blog post that I'll have to search the interwebs for. If I can find it, I'll link it in the show notes. But procrastination actually, in type A people, we still procrastinate. I'm actually, believe it or not, a very type A person. I come across as very type B, but I'm actually quite type A. And type A people procrastinate just as bad as type B and when I say type A, type B, you know, I'm talking about the from the back 60s, 70s, type A are the highly organized and, you know, tightly wound, and type B are the laid back kind of people. And type A people procrastinate by doing other things. And so I always love it when somebody says, yeah, I'm supposed to be working on my thesis. That's why I'm mowing the lawn. Or even better, that's why I'm changing the spark plugs on the lawnmower. It, it's like... I need to get some work done. Where are those yaks? I need to shave all of the yaks because I don't want to work on this other thing. <laughs> and there's a there's a hack that you can use, which is that if you need to work on a thing and you're avoiding it, find something else that you want to avoid even more. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And then avoid them both. <laughs> yeah. I need to clean my house. Uh, I don't want to clean my house. I guess I'll write my thesis instead. <laughs> the, the sad thing is I'd probably pick cleaning my house well you need to pick something that is you know house cleaning is terrifying to me I don't know if any of you have seen my house but there are like game trails I, I am one step short of, of going on hoarders honestly and <laughs> it's also on my mind because we recently just shoveled everything out of my office and it's actually kind of clean in here which is really freaking me out man I, I, I might have to come see that I've never seen it like that it's, it's pretty amazing I, the carpet in here is white I didn't know that you have carpet in there? I have carpet yeah <laughs> So I guess it's my duty to ask the really weird elephant in the room question. So I have an elephant in the room question. Go for it. How do you increase creativity? Can you work on your creativity? I mean, I can give you an opinion. It's not based in anything other than my own experience. Mm -hmm. But it seems like I have to kind of find the things that amp up my creativity and then practice those or do those. And so, I mean, even on the code level, I mean, sometimes it's exorcism.io type things, but sometimes I just don't feel like doing that either. And so I'll go out because, you know, I want to do something that has a purpose to it. So I'll go build some tiny little website that, you know, just does something simple, but it feels like it has a purpose to it. But, you know, I, I kind of have to figure out what those things are that make me creative or make me want to be creative. And I think it's a game of engagement. I don't think it's necessarily a game of you have a certain quantity of creativity that you, you can either use up or fill up. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's a game of, okay, what's interesting right now? Mm -hmm. And then doing that or doing something related to that all the time, you know, in the background, then trying to figure out what I need to spend some of the creativity on. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes me wonder, what is creativity? Like, if you increase your creativity, Ooh. what does it mean to have less creativity? Well, if you have 7.2 creativity, <laughs> and then at the end of the day, you have 6.9 creativity, obviously, you have less creativity now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't know. I always It always bothered me when people said, you know, I'm not creative or I am creative. I just, mm -hmm. I don't really know what that means, right? Like, if you... Is it just the ability to create a thing? Because I think anyone can create a thing. Is it creating a thing that causes me to be happy or excited? Because I feel like everyone can do that too. So when you rate yourself and say, I'm not creative or I'm very creative, what exactly are you talking about? Yeah, I have a hard time with that because, I mean, I'm, I've been quiet for most of this episode because I don't really think I'm, I am that creative. <laughs> There's that annoying, yeah, that annoying thing. I mean, uh <sighs> No, I'm laughing at you for, for having said yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Just to be clear. I know. Well, I think a lot of people, when they say I'm not creative, what they mean is is that I don't participate in the things that I see other people doing. It's it's a self-comparison thing. And that's just it. Like, I don't, you know, unlike 
uh, everyone else on this show, I don't draw, and my guitar is too rusty, is too, not rusty, <laughs> is too dusty for me to claim that I, I play anymore. You know, when I'm not working, I'm hanging out with my family, and if I'm, you know, if I'm doing something fun to distract myself, it's not, you know, drawing, making a painting or something, it's, it's like shooting aliens in Halo, because I'm that fried. So, yeah, like, I don't have those sort of easy-to-pick-out creative pursuits that uh, everybody else seems to have. Okay, so do you want something to reassure you a little bit, Avdi? Sure. Okay, number one, I haven't picked up a pencil and drawn anything in a couple of years, other than, like, doodles on napkins and that sort of thing. And number two, when my nephew moved out, oh, gosh, eight years ago, he needed a guitar for guitar class, so I gave him my guitar. And... I haven't been able to afford a new one. So you at least have a guitar. I just have the dust. Um, <laughs> now I, have one. I consider myself a creative person, but I'm not creating Ruby tapas every week. I feel like there, I, are, uh, there are like, there are like two different things that I think of when I think about creativity. There's like, okay, so yeah, creating Ruby tapas. I do a lot of writing. Um, a mm-hmm. lot of that goes into, into Ruby tapas ep- episodes. I also write books and I think of that as creative in the sense of creating a thing. I mean, it's work, you know, it's, yeah. it's work and you create an artifact, but I don't think of it as terribly creative in that more artsy sense, because like the way I think of it, usually the way I think of it is it's an extremely straightforward exercise. Once I've decided what I want to talk about, it's just, it's, it's like basically proceeding straightforward from beginning to end. You know, I need to get this idea across. Okay. Start at the beginning, tell this, you know, tell the story of the idea and then end at the end. It, you know, it, it's like digging a ditch almost, but I am creating something. So that's like one idea of creation. And then there's, I guess there's another concept of creativity, which is, I guess I would sum up as making something novel, mm-hmm. so making something that, that strikes people as novel. And I guess I do that occasionally in my work. I will maybe come up with a way of illustrating an idea, which, stri- which strikes people as novel. And I always feel really, really good about myself when I do. Yeah, a lot of that goes into stuff that's totally not coding. You know, it's business related, but it totally isn't coding. I mean, coming up with a novel way of selling a product or of getting the word out about something or a novel collaboration or something like that. You know, so that's, that's like the other side of the other thing I think of when I think of creativity is, is novelty. Yeah. So I, I want to kind of challenge your idea of creativity a little bit because I don't think creativity is about the output. I think creativity is about the idea or concept or you know inspiration or things like that and you know so you've done i don't even know how many hundreds of ruby tapas episodes uh 200 and something i think but i look at that and i'm like man how does he come up with a new thing every week to talk about <laughs> or you know i mean some of the things that you point out in the ruby tapas episode that you probably accept as just kind of a you know something you take for granted i mean i watch it and i'm like i never would have even thought about doing something that way and then having those ideas you know kind of drive some other work but i think there's a difference between the creativity of the idea and the creativity of the you know the concept even the concept of the video or the concept of what you want to teach and then the actual output And and that that initial spark is is more on the i guess the novelty side you know the having the idea in the first place yeah. It sounds like we're drawing a distinction. Is it, is this fair? We're drawing a distinction between productivity and invention. Yes. I, I yeah. And so. I guess the subtlety there for me is that I see some of the work that I do that I guess people would view as creative. I mean, you know, writing. I don't view it as entirely like creative in that novel sense. Mm-hmm. You know, like I said, I, I view it more as digging a ditch than maybe some people would. But, you know, somebody asked me about, like, where do I get all my ideas a few weeks back? And I was like, I don't have ideas. <laughs> people uh, people <laughs> usually ask me, why do I get all my ideas? That's actually a Stephen King joke, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I was actually good at having ideas, I'd, I'd be a millionaire by now. But it's, it's interesting that some of what we've ta- been talking about is, you know, the idea of getting ideas for programming or being energized for ideas for programming from other creative outlets. I honestly feel like it's almost the opposite. I get ideas from input. Mm-hmm. And I actually feel like I have a, you know, there's a limit to how much creative output I can have. 
And if, you know, if I was putting more of it into, into other pursuits, artistic pursuits or something like that, I'd probably have less of it for programming or for, for teaching. But, you know, for me, ideas, it's all about diverse inputs. It's all about reading a lot, talking to people, uh, you know, having conversations at, at conferences, pairing with people and having interesting ideas from that. And also a lot of it is from inputs that are very tangential to programming. Like I try to, these days when I run, I try to listen to interesting nonfiction books, which often spark some very interesting ideas. And they also get my mind off of programming and, and give me that, that subconscious time. You know, for me, it's all about diverse inputs. I, I think of it as cultivating good thoughts and making sure they get invited to all the best parties and meet other thoughts and, you know, and then have an opportunity to, you know, to hit it off and, and go somewhere private to get it, get to know each other better. You know, and that part of it I think of as like effectively is, is getting out of sleep, you know, letting those ideas roll around in the subconscious uh, either while I'm sleeping or doing something relaxing or otherwise, you know, mind numbing. Are you saying your brain is like a hotel in New Jersey for ideas? <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to point out, you know, I mean, the way that you're talking about this, I'm going to use another example um, of, of Matt, you know, when he created Ruby. Um, I think that was a creative endeavor to create a new programming mm -hmm. language. And it was influenced by a lot of other ideas. In fact, um, most movements these days are either taking parts of another movement or idea that people like or rebelling against ideas that they don't like. And so Matt's had plenty of both of those when he created Ruby. And sure, you know, the, the process of writing C to build a, an interpreter that would interpret the, the programming language was kind of a digging the ditch kind of thing. It was a highly technical endeavor. But the ideas that went into it, a lot of them weren't his own and, you know, really came into how do I want to implement this? How do I want to, you know, how, how would these work together? And, yeah. and so, you know, that, that is creativity in my opinion. Yeah, um, I, I, I totally agree. And I feel like that's why I've never thought of creativity as inventing or as, you know, creating novel ideas. Cause I don't really think that any idea is new. I think that everything's just a remix. Actually, there's a web series called Everything is a Remix. And I really don't like that web series, but I appreciate the point. <laughs> is, I appreciate the point, which is... It's like a clip show for everything. Yeah, pretty much. But yeah, I, I really think that creativity is about taking a process or something that already exists and just changing it, you know, slightly or maybe in a huge way. But I think that, to your point, Avdi, it really is just about having all these inputs, which is why I mostly read nonfiction and try to, you know, keep up with different spaces in different fields so I can have this bucket of all these different ideas and inputs that kind of simmer and then one day in the future it'll come together in some interesting format. And I think that's really what creativity is about. I've always viewed it as the, as the process of manufacturing serendipity. Ooh, I, I like, like that. that. That's awesome. So Avdi, I have a, a creativity detecting question for you, which is at the time of this recording, you have 243 Ruby Tapas released. Yes. And you're just farting them out uh, without letter, <laughs> letter hindrance at this point. Um, Why is he farting them out? Why can't he do other things? It's, it's Dave, don't ask. I would, I, would come up, I would come up with a more elegant metaphor, but I don't do that sort of thing. So here's the question Stop for stifling you. Dave's style of creativity, okay? <laughs> with, with Dave's metaphors, everybody does that type of thing. <laughs> I have two kinds of metaphors, the silent ones. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> number, number two. Yeah, yeah, number one and number two. There we go. Nicely done, sir. <laughs> My question for you is this. Are you afraid of running out of ideas? You know, the funny thing is no, not really. I was confident the answer would be no. Why are you not afraid of running out of ideas? I mean, you've done 243 of these. You ought to be out of ideas by now. <laughs> because ideas aren't like that, I guess. I mean, I think it's a combination of knowing that ideas aren't really like that because it's like Saran said, nothing's really new under the sun. Everything we do, everything, any, anything that like a, a, an educator of programmers does is a remix. It's framing an idea in a new way. I mean, heck, half of the patterns and styles of programming, et cetera, that we have are basically ways of framing the same problems in new ways. And, you know, we're never really going to run out of ways of framing things in new ways. And that's, that's fine because a lot, I think a lot of human 
learning and, and, and creativity is driven not by how objectively new something is, it's by novelty. It's by the fact that something new sparks our brain. And it doesn't really matter so much what it is as mm-hmm. the fact that it's new to us that gets the old engine running. Yeah. Um, you know, so there are infinite ways of, of sort of restating an idea or looking at it from a new way. And it's also, it's also the knowledge that, you know, the field that I'm, that I've given myself is huge. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. Ruby itself is a big language. Then there's patterns and there's refactoring and there's testing and, and, uh, it, it's just, it's endless. I have a friend who writes a business blog and he and I went to lunch and he was telling me that he's terrified of running out of ideas. And he has this list of 10 really good blog post ideas that he guards jealously in case he ever wakes up with writer's block. And I let him have it with both barrels. I turned on him and I said, your next 10 blog posts need to be those 10 ideas. Get your best ideas out because until you get rid of the ideas that you have in your head, you can't have new ones that are any good. So I'm one of those people that does consider himself to be very creative, and I'm more and more convinced that whether you can consider yourself creative or not is BS. It's just a label that you stick on yourself, and it's just a story that you tell yourself, and at the end of the day, you're releasing a lot more episodes of anything than I am, and you're not creative and I am, so what does that tell us about creativity? It tells us nothing about creativity. Terry Pratchett once famously said, there's no such thing as writer's block, only lazy writers. (laughs) Oh, burn. (laughs) Okay. And my favorite writing quote is from W. Somerset Maugham, who said, I write only when inspiration strikes. Fortunately, it strikes every morning at nine o'clock sharp. (laughs) (laughs) And the whole point of like NaNoWriMo, we're coming up on November, uh, which is National Novel Writers Month, is to sit down and crank out you know, 2,500 is or 2,000 words a day for 30 days straight. And generally what people find, you, you hear this experience of people who have won NaNoWriMo that the first week all they did was crank out 14,000 words of dreck, just random drivel, and then the ideas started coming. And so my point of this is if you don't think you're creative – it might be because the ideas in your head are cramped and you're not doing anything with them. And so get them out of your head so that you can have new ideas. Get, get, take your best ideas and get rid of them. Get them out into the world. Get them out of your head. And that makes room for new ideas. Yeah, that's a I, really good point. I also want to just go ahead with one other thing, and that is is that I know a lot of people stifle their creativity because they're afraid that other people won't like the output. Right. Uh, and you know what? Crank it out. And then if it's crap, throw it away. Yeah. Yeah. But, but at least then you're moving things through and processing these new ideas and making new connections. And eventually you'll come up with something that where you're actually proud of it. And oh, gee, that, that's pretty good. I think the point here is, is that just do it. It's incredibly easy to underestimate the amount of clearing the pipes that needs to be done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you either haven't done something before, or haven't done it in a long time. I mean, there can be days or weeks sometimes worth of pipe clearing before the real ideas start to come. That's something that I have ex- been experiencing with Rails clips. You know, when I was doing Teach Me to Code, I mean, I just crank out a video in like an hour. And I was like, oh, okay, you know. But I came back and I started putting these videos together. And now, yeah, I, I have to, it's been kind of a grind to get the first few videos out because I'm a, a out of practice. B, I think I have a better idea of what kind of quality I want to put out. But C, you know, yeah, I, I've, I've got these videos that I want to make, these ideas that I want to put out. And I think I have to clear the pipes and kind of, you know, grease the works a little bit before I can really have the kind of flow that I had when I was doing it before. I think it's just important to put your bad idea out there too. Cause especially like for me, design is really hard. Like it, it, and I'll have an idea in my head and I really hate it. And I think it, you know, it looks like crap and it feels like crap. But as soon as I actually mock it up and create it in Photoshop, I'm one step closer to seeing why I didn't like it. And I noticed so many more things that I just, you know, couldn't see when it was just an idea in my head. And yeah. then from there, I can say, oh, well, this color is a bit off or there's not enough contrast. And I can talk about it more intelligently and then I can work towards fixing it. And I think another really important 
part of being creative or trying to be more creative is just studying other people that you like, right? So whenever I'm designing anything, the first thing I'll, I'll do is I'll just look at a bunch of really great examples and I'll talk out loud and I'll say, this is why I like this website or this is why I hate this website and this is what works for me about these colors and this is what is terrible about this layout. And then I can I jot down notes and say, these are the elements that I like. And then I try to use that to incorporate my first draft, which is always terrible. And then from there I build. So those are like the two things I think are really important. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I just made a very creative mental connection here. Uh oh. Taking your ideas and getting them out there and learning from them and adapting and getting new ideas and going forward is kind of the agile way of developing ideas and thinking and planning. Taking your favorite idea and sitting on it until it's perfect is waterfall for, <laughs> crea for creativity. True. Yeah. Robert Heinlein's famous rules of writing start with, number one, you must write. Number two, yes. you must sell what you write. In other words, get it out there. Yeah, the, the book that I mentioned earlier, Dorothea Brand's Becoming, On Becoming a Writer, her first rule is, if you want to be a writer, get up and start writing for an hour every single day. Lots of people want to have, have written. They want to have sold a novel. But if you don't want to sit at a computer and actually do the act of writing, you are not a writer, and you're done. You can put this book down. You don't have to read the rest of it. Because if you don't want to do writing, you're not a writer, and you're not ever going to be. So uh, one other question I have about all of this is, are the ideas, because I, I, I think I understand this, but I, I know I'm going to get it wrong, but it seems like ideas and concepts and kind of that kind of thing is more right brain, and the execution details and how we're going to implement it is more left brain. So does creativity mostly come out of the right brain, or is there some left brain mixed in? Or did I totally just say all of that totally backward and wrong? So I, I gave a talk at Mountain West a couple of years ago where I started out with, by pointing out that, you know, I asked the audience, how many of you understand that left brain versus right brain is bunk? And, you know, all the hands went up. And I said, okay, you guys are the problem. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I won't go into a rehash of that talk, but... Again, we're getting into this notion of invention versus productivity. And if an invention, Saran mentioned that everything's just kind of a clip show, that everything's a remix, and the right side of the brain generally focuses itself with broadening of focus and integration and synthesis of ideas, and the left brain tends to focus itself on narrowing of focus, elimination of extraneous context, and isolation of facts. And I'm just going to skip the long rambly story, why not, and just jump right to the point, which is that every interesting endeavor that humans do, from working a math problem or a logic puzzle all the way up to painting a picture... We've put people in MRIs and studied them while doing this, and it turns out that it requires full engagement from both halves of the brain at the same time. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, when you're writing software and you're, you're really in the zone and you're like, man, we're going to get you to you know, do this thing, you're figuring out how to get Nokogiri to parse a, a document and you're dealing with the XML, da, 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 and you're isolating context and you're coming down and you've got to make sure that this method is decoupled. But at the same time, you've got this entire application architecture and the problem that it's going to solve in the world, and it's all floating in your head at the same time. And you have to have both of those going at the same time. Makes sense. And, it, and it's true of writing and painting, right? I mean, you think that's very creative, right brain stuff. You've got this, this cool story idea you want to get on the page, but you have to write it in proper grammar. And that requires isolating context and making sure that, you know, you have verb and subject agreement. And, or if you're painting, that you've got the right color and that the brush stroke is exactly the right size and shape on the page or on the canvas. I took a long time to skip the story and jump right to the point, didn't I? <laughs> I, I <laughs> Yeah, but it, it it is kind of in, engaging the part of my brain where it's like, oh, new idea, you know, new connection, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and then you know thinking about what the implications are, and I think that's a lot of where some of the creativity that I I get comes from too. So, for example, I was watching a Ruby Tapas the other day, and Avdi was talking about uh, default parameters in Ruby, and he put yield in as the default parameter, and mm -hmm. my mind kind of went, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> and then it was like. Oh, I bet you could do this, and I bet you could do this other thing, and I wonder if this would work, you know, and and 
I, I think that's just as valid a form of creativity as anything else. And I Absolutely. like, I like the idea that Avdi brought up earlier in that, you know, if I fill my head with a bunch of good ideas and then it starts drawing the connections, then I'm coming up with a lot of better ideas. That's frustrating though. I mean, <laughs> it's frustrating for me because I always want to go after something head on. I want to just, you know, make a plan and execute. And it's just not something you can do for ideas. You have to sneak up on them while whistling nonchalantly, pretending mm-hmm. that you aren't aren't trying to sneak up on them. See, we got known knowns and known unknowns, and then we've got unknown knowns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of gnomes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. I would love to watch okay, a this, clip. Okay, this is just Donald my Terry Pratchett. <laughs> yeah, I, I would love to watch Donald Rumsfeld saying, we got known gnomes and unknown gnomes. <laughs> The new threat. Yes. And gnome gnomes. gnomes. So do you guys think that everyone should try to be creative, especially as a programmer? Yes. Absolutely. I think everyone should be hammered into the same mold. Well, <laughs> well so what I'm thinking here is that I think we all have different, as Avdi put it, different inputs. And I think we all have different experience, which is essentially, you know, past inputs. And so I think people should take advantage of the opportunity to learn what works and doesn't work for them and to explore kind of what the limits are of what they can come up with. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, so what I'm saying is, is that given where we are and who we are and what we take in, what we're going to come up with, you know, our creativity, so to speak, is going to be different from person to person. And I think that's why the conversations that we have about bringing in diverse groups is so important. You know, I, I don't know that everyone's going to buy into, at least personally or, you know, to themselves, they're not going to completely buy into, well, you know, those groups are underprivileged and so they should have a better shot. I think if we couch it in terms of, hey, you know, they bring a different set of uh, stimulus or self-stimulus, whatever, you know, inputs, experience, that means that they bring a different brand of creativity that's going to solve our problems in new and novel ways, not just for the novelty, but because some of those ways are actually going to be better. You know, if we're having that conversation, I think we can get a lot more people on board with those conversations because there's a clear benefit to the community, to our businesses, and to each other beyond the the fairness arguments and, and what's right arguments. Anyway, so yeah, and if you don't feel like you're creative, I think you need to look at what you are able to give the world and give your employer and recognize some of the areas where maybe you are creative and then see if there are ways where you can push the boundaries a little bit and figure out, you know, maybe something new and novel that the rest of us are going to benefit from as well. I think the problem is that when you hear the word creative, I think people also assume artistic. Yes. And even from this conversation, yeah. you know, that's that's not really what it is. It's more than that. So if you don't see yourself as being artistic, you don't play a musical instrument, you don't draw, and you don't really care to, how do you become creative? How do you work on that? I need another hour to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> can you boil it down? I don't I know have if a, I have a good answer to that. Can I throw out a question for the listeners to think about for a few minutes? Sure. This is a this is actually a creativity building exercise. So, if you've got a piece of paper handy, grab one and a pencil, and I just want you to write down. Imagine you've got a paper clip. Now, write down all the things that you can do with that paper clip. Okay, back to the show. We'll come back to the we'll come back to the paper clip thing here in a minute. I wrote down my two things that I can do with a paper. Clip. Okay, so so you have two things that you can do with a paper clip. You can clip yeah. together paper. I did not have that one. Oh, okay, all right. That was a good one, though. <laughs> yeah, how uncreative of you. <laughs> You would be surprised how many people overlook that one when you ask them to come up with creative... Because they immediately think, oh, I must come up with rebellious uses for a paperclip. Yeah. So, Ron, what, what were your two things? The first one was bend it, and the second was eat oh. it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Things that you can make. I, I, you're right. My, my bad. I said things that you can do with a paperclip. I'm, uh, what I should have said is things that you can make with a paperclip. Uh, okay. I need a second chance. All right. Okay. Start over. The point of this exercise is that if you give people 60 seconds to come up with things that they can make out of a paperclip, most people will struggle to come up with 10 things. I did this uh, a couple of months ago at a user group meeting, and I had probably 20 people in the room, and the I would say the average was five. Most people had five things. A couple people had three. One guy had like 12 things, and... 
the point of this exercise, well, let me, I don't want to put Saran too much on the spot, but uh, roughly, roughly how many ideas have you come up with, Saran? I came up with three, and then I could have kept going, but I was just kind of, you know, not really, mm-hmm. wasn't happy with my other ideas. I yeah. Um, yeah I've, they I've were all just of, shapes, you know, I was going to say, like, yeah. diamond, square, circle, and I was like, those are lame, I wouldn't want to make those. Ah, okay, okay, so this, I, I was hoping you'd say something even better, like, then I decided, well, I was going to do a podcast today, so why not? <laughs> um, that's That's the ADD answer, which is, you know, I'm still writing my list of things over here, because shiny thing... <laughs> okay, so here, here's the interesting thing. When we're given something, we tend to focus on the shape of that creation. And everybody knows you can bend a paperclip. And so when you ask people, what can you do with a paperclip? Or, what can you make out of a paperclip? They will invariably come up with a list of things that involve bending the paperclip. So things that you can do with a paperclip, you can melt them down and make earrings. Uh, you can actually bend them into earrings and just stick them in your ears. I've actually seen people do that, although it was high school at the time. Oh, uh, yeah. But you can bend them down and cast them into things. You can take 10,000 of them and fill sandbags with them. You can, if you get away from the function of a paperclip as a piece of steel wire and get into its constituent elements, which are, it's a bunch of iron, right? You could make an electromagnet out of a paperclip or out of a bunch of them. A lot of people will come up with, you can make chains out of them, right? Because we've all done that, right? You, you, you find a coworker you don't like and you chain all of their paperclips together. <laughs> and because it's fun to do. And then when you're done, it's their problem, right? That, that explains a lot. That <laughs> <laughs> explains your paperclip uh, we're, jar. We're going to talk after the show. Yeah, I know. I know. But as soon as you ta- start talking about melting things down or running an electric current through them and you go, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, paperclips are just made out of steel. Anything you can do with steel, you can do with paperclips. If you have enough of them, you can build cars out of them. Okay. And now you're out of the silo. You're in, you're in this thinking silo of just bend the thing. Even bending the thing is a siloed thought because we think about, well, you can bend it into a triangle. No, 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 no. You can bend it into a scale model of a Dorito used for reference in a sales talk. Ooh. Okay. okay. Yeah, I like that one a lot. Yep. Um, that, can, can you see that that's a completely different thing than bending it into a triangle? And the point of this exercise is to, to demonstrate that if you take the, the form and function of a thing that you are given and consider it at kind of like the subatomic level, like if I melted you down or shredded you and recycled you, if I broke you up for parts, what could I build out of your parts? If this then translates, and you can take programmers and you can send them off and they will, I've seen actually a programmer take this and then go back to a code library. And for the first time, this programmer decided to open up the source code of the library that he was using and read it. And I'm like, why are you doing that? And he said, well, I want to see what, what this is made of. And, you know, it, he was a, a younger programmer and he found an, an interesting way of looping over collections inside this library. And he now uses that in his code. And he hadn't thought of doing that until he thought about tearing apart a paperclip. I like that so much. And I feel like, I think that I, I went through that this week, actually, when I was working on um, single sign-on and I was setting up something for, for Code Newbie. Mm-hmm. And when I was doing that, I felt like I was very stuck on finding you know, a gem or a solution that already existed because there was a way to perform this function already, right? Like there was a way to do it. And I was very stuck on finding the blog post or the article or the whatever that told me exactly how to do it. And that just wasn't working. So I said, okay, I need to actually break this down into its individual pieces and understand what each piece is doing and then reuse what I already know to connect those pieces. And so kind of breaking it down and getting over the, this is how it's supposed to be and more into, Mm -hmm. well, these are, you know, these are the individual pieces and this is how each unit works. And now I can reorganize and move the units to do what I want it to do. And that was a yes. huge, you know, just conceptual breakthrough. Yes. It's, it's all about rules. You've been handed a paperclip or some source code, and implicitly we assume there are some rules that come along with this that must be followed. Yes. Capital, capital M, capital B, capital F. And maybe even with a trademark at the end. Must be followed TM. And gosh, a big part of creativity to quote Morpheus, is to recognize that some of these rules can be bent, others broken. 
Yeah, and what you were talking about earlier, that's called functional fixedness in psychology. And yes. There's, um, yeah, and there's a, a very famous uh, psychological experiment that happened where the researchers gave a, a bunch of people, they gave them a box full of tacks. It was like a little cardboard box full mm-hmm. of tacks. And they gave people a candle. And they said, find a way to pretty much attach this candle onto the wall. And yeah. so people try, and, and a box of matches as well. And so people tried to like melt the wax and stick the wax you know, stick the candle with the melted wax onto the wall. It didn't work. They tried putting, like, like the actual tacks through the candle, which obviously didn't work. And then, finally, they, for a different group of people, they removed the tacks out of the box and put them next to it. And all of a sudden, people figured out that, oh, I can put the candle on that box and then use the thumbtacks to tack the box against the wall. And now <laughs> I have a candle. And, you know, eventually both groups got to that point, but the, the group that got there the fastest were the people who saw the thumbtacks out of the box because they said, oh, this isn't just for, you know, holding thumbtacks. I can do other things with this. Yeah. Avdi mentioned earlier that you can't just have ideas. You can't just go have ideas really hard. I'm going to think so hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Those are um, also the noises I make when I have Yes, them. yes. <laughs> I've been so good. I I have removed poop jokes. He really the, has. The careful listener will note that for the past hundred episodes or so, I have not done poop jokes on the show. And I apologize. Oh, and I apologize for this phrasing, but they're leaking out. Um, <laughs> I apologize. I'll be better by next episode. I really—that was actually a conscious choice, guys. I, I decided to remove poop jokes from my repertoire while I was on and the then show. We just wouldn't leave it alone, would we? Yeah, nope. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I can't remember what I was going to say. Oh no, this, this idea that we're going to go have an idea really hard, and then we all made our constipation noise. And <laughs> the point that I was going to raise is that Dan Pink in the book Drive. I don't know if he does it in the book drive, but he gave an interview where he was talking about drive and afterwards there was a Q and a, and somebody asked him and he talked about this, this matchbook candle experiment and he added a really interesting element. He said there was a, there was a follow up study where they, they did the same study and a few people figured it out. They did another study where they gave people a time limit and they gave another group of people a financial reward, like 50 bucks, 500 bucks. If you can stick the candle to the wall and the tighter the time limit and the greater the financial reward, the fewer people came up with the solution. When you put a constraint, when you say, I'm going to think really hard, you are locking yourself into left brain. You lock yourself hard into functional fixedness where you just say, I've got to use what I've got. I've got to get this done. I've got to get this shipped. Don't bother me with creative ideas. I've got to get this working. And that's when productivity kind of goes bad. Sometimes you got to ship, right? Real artists ship. But you also, sometimes real artists have to play. And I think that's the lesson that we can take for functional fixedness is that, you know, recognize that if it's, if it's, two in the morning and you're still at work because the deadline is in six hours and your stuff isn't working and you've got to get it shipped. Now is maybe not the time for creativity. Maybe now is the time for knuckling down and just getting the code cranked out and out the door. But, you know, if your code isn't finished, that's the time for functional fixedness. Finish your code. But if your code doesn't work because it has a fundamental flaw, staying up all night and thinking really hard about it is not the way to solve this problem. You need to back off and relax and go take a nap and go play ping pong and let your brain sneak up on the problem because the harder you think about it, the more functionally fixed you're going to be. So does that mean that being creative under any kind of stress is generally not good or is there good stress to be under when you're trying to be creative? I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I don't know the answer to that. I suspect that the answer is yes. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Right. I mean, there are times when like, I love doing like coding exercises, like, like global day of code retreat. There is a rock hard time constraint. You get like 30 minutes and then you have to throw your program away and then you have to then they change the parameters of the problem and you get another 30 minutes and then you have to throw your code away and that was so hard for me at the beginning of the day i'm like no no i wrote this co- no don't throw it away i wrote this code and by the end of the day i was able to just let the code go 
And it was really cool because by the end of the day, I no longer cared about the time constraint. I was able to escape functional fixedness while under a time constraint because in eight hours, I had done 16 iterations. Actually, it's more like eight or 10. You, there's there's talking in between. But I had thrown away code so many times during that day that I no longer worried about finishing the code under the time constraint. And I was able to relax and be creative under that stress. And so I wouldn't say that I would want to be under stress while being creative because I think it, it kind of blocks up the pipes. But the practice every once in a while of forcing yourself to be creative while under stress can be a useful skill as well. I'm just wondering here how how much more creative MacGyver would have been if he hadn't always had a ticking bomb. Yeah, seriously. The man would have resurrected the space program. Of course, we still had a space program back then. <laughs> <laughs> or how much less creative he would have been if he hadn't had all the options with his pocket knife. Or more creative. Yeah, that's, that's if he a, hadn't that's been a, relying upon it. I don't know. That's a good point, right? There's this, there's this trade-off between invention and productivity, and I tend to lean way hard on the invention side to the point that productivity gets neglected. If I don't have a ticking time bomb, I'm not going to be creative. I'm not going to ship anything because there's a whole lot of Mass Effect that hasn't been played in my house and it needs to get, <laughs> it, it needs, it needs getting played. That's, <laughs> ain't nobody else going to do it. That's right. That's right. These collectors aren't going to wipe themselves out. <laughs> I was one thing that I do want to say, um, as far as the the putting yourself under stress thing. I find that time limits work really well for me to get that first idea out because I find that if I know I have, you know, as long as I want to take to draw that first cartoon or write that first post, then I just spend a lot of time thinking about it, and I spend a lot of time, you know, going through it in my head, and I never get it actually down. But the moment I say, "You have one hour. You're going to write this post. You're going to post it." then that, you know, gets me started. And once yeah. I start, I'm usually okay. I have a follow-on thought to that. And that is, believe it or not, here in 2014, there are still a lot of programmers. The, the, all programmers were this way back in 1997. But there are still a lot of you out there who don't want to contribute to open source because you are ashamed of your code and you're embarrassed to let other people look. And, you, and so you say, well, let me hang on to it. Let me polish this. No. Go find something in your library that you have been sitting on and publish it. Just push it up to GitHub and be done. Uh, don't, don't get yourself sued. Don't push up company non-disclosable stuff. But you've got a library that you want to look prettier before you push it up. And that's not how open source works. Push up the code you have in the state that it is and then go back and clean it up out of embarrassment or let other people take a look at it and give you feedback. But do it now. Do it right now. Shut off the pot. Well, wait for the end of the podcast and then go do it. <laughs> if anybody does this, ping me on Twitter and let me know. I want to see your project. I would love to hear about this. I think it's important too because, again, you know, it gives us a new set of inputs. If we get reviews mm -hmm. on this stuff. I, I just, keep, just keep coming back. So you have more ideas, more stuff in your head that you can draw on the next time that you are trying to solve a problem mm -hmm. or come up with a creative answer. All right, I don't want this to end. It's so good, but uh, it's the more the to... the more ideas we have, the more ideas we're gonna have. Yes. So very true. Let's we need to nip this in the bud, guys. All right, let's do picks then. <laughs> David, you hinted that you have some picks and some blame to pass around. I do, I do. I pinged Avdi on Friday. So a little bit of background. I'm taking a month off to finish the job replacement guide. I'm hoping I can get it finished in Yay. the next in the next month. And I, I started by pinging Avdi and saying, is taking a month off to finish a book a good idea? And he laughed and said, that's the only way I've ever been able to finish a book. And I'm like, okay, I'm on the right track here. And what I didn't expect Avdi to do was to completely torpedo <laughs> my brain. <laughs> <laughs> so subversively, we got talking and I mentioned to him that Mass Effect is my favorite game of all time. In fact, on the top 10 list of games, Mass Effect takes up three slots. Mass Effect 1 gets a slot, Mass Effect 2 gets a slot, and okay, the first 98% of Mass Effect 3. Everybody that's played <laughs> Mass Effect 3 knows that the ending is awful. It's yes. absolutely unforgivable. And it never occurred to me. I, I've actually had a, I had a professional writer, Dan Willis, I love him to death, actually tell me to my face, 
play Mass Effect until you get to the part where you beam up to the ship and then shut the game off and tell yourself you win and never finish the game or you will be unhappy. And th- th- that was honestly his recommended alternate ending to the game is just shut the game off at that point. And I had completely forgotten about the whole concept of fan culture and rabid fan culture. And the thing about Mass Effect is that there's this huge fan community and you know when Star Trek screws up a script, the fans can't let it lie. They, they, they never say that was just lazy writing or that was just you know a bad script. They always come up with an excuse. They come up with what's called headcanon, which is something that's not canonical except in my own head to make it work, right? You can't beam through shields in Star Trek, but when they rescue Scotty, they have to beam him through the shields or the script doesn't work. So in this one time, they beam through, they transport through shields. And they never explain how they do it or why. But if you go to fan sites, there's somebody ready to explain how and why it happens. And Avdi pointed me to a fan-generated theory called the indoctrination theory. And all I will say about this is that the fans have gone back to Mass Effect 3 and said, let's accept that the ending really is the ending. How do we fix the way we think about the entire game in order to make the ending work? <laughs> and they they put forth this, this theory that the secret substory of Mass Effect 3 is that Shepard is being indoctrinated. He's been around Reaper technology more than anybody else. And you know that the longer you're around Reaper tech, the more indoctrinated you become. And there is about a 20-minute video that puts forth a lot of really compelling alternate interpretations. Now, I've looked at their evidence. I'm going to tell you this up front. There are so many flame wars on the, the, the forums. You, you don't even mess with it. Don't, don't mess with it. Just go watch the indoctrination theory video. I've looked at some of the things that they claim are evidence, and it's pretty clear that it's just an oversight on the part of the animator. I, I genuinely think the writers did bad writing. And because the writers themselves came out and said, yeah, we were the two lead writers revealed after the game was released that they were fighting through the entire writing of the sh- final episode, and that's what, what wrecked the ending of the game. But the indoctrination theory actually makes the ending kind of fun. And this has torpedoed my brain so hard that it's been a week, and I have, in my all of last weekend and through the evenings, I have played through Mass Effect 1 and 2, and I'm about to start 3, just so that I can watch this headcanon story of Shepard being indoctrinated. Anyway, this is way too long uh, a ramble about this. There are as many videos debunking the indoctrination theory as there are videos explaining it. And the bottom line is the ending of Mass Effect 3 is so awful that you got to make something up to make it palatable. And I like this indoctrination theory. It actually makes the ending kind of satisfying. And that's it doesn't make it great, but it makes it satisfying. And that is the one thing that the ending really, really lacked. So I'll stop there. That's my pick for today. All right, Avdi, what are your picks? Well, I'll just start no out by rebuttal. S- <laughs> <laughs> no, no rebuttal. I, 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 I'll just start out by by saying that uh, uh, if you're wondering why why people would go on and on this much about a video game, I don't play a ton of video games. But if I were asked to list my favorite science fiction movie series, I'm being dead serious. I would probably include Mass Effect in that list. Uh, the whole series. It is one of the most compelling. Uh, I actually mostly watch somebody else play it, play it through, um, mm-hmm. less than, I, I've only, I've played it myself less, but the writing, the dialogue, the fact that everything you do in it while being fun and gamey is also very cinematic. It's one of the most engrossing science fiction stories I've ever watched. I think um, when you and I, when you and I were really talking, good. when you and I were talking last week, you actually said the phrase, my favorite science fiction movie is watching somebody else play Mass Effect. Yeah, I actually, for, for weeks on end, I would go up and I would sit down and I would watch the Mass, Mass Effect show. And it was my favorite show <laughs> on, on, on screen. It was the only thing I wanted to watch. I wanted to see what was going to happen next. That's awesome. Yeah, so, okay, picks. Hey, I haven't had, I don't think I've done a, a beer pick for a while. Uh, I just got a, a new one, which I think is a relatively new brew from one of my beloved Pennsylvania craft breweries. It's called Four Play IPA. It's from Stout's brewery which is always a confusing one to say because it sounds like a kind of beer but it's s-t-o-u-d-t-s stouts and it's just a a really 
beautifully hopped IPA. I, I like IPAs, but I'm picky about them. I don't like the ones that are just monster hop. I, I, you know, I don't mind lots of hops, but they need to have good flavor. They need to have a good aroma and stuff like that. This one is called Foreplay IPA because it has four different kinds of hops and they're very nicely mixed. I recommend it if you can find it. I also pick an app that I've been using for a while. I, um, I like to stay at least a little bit informed about what are the current, like, news events of the world, but I always have a hard time finding good sources for that because I find most of, like, the, the news sites out there are just, like, bloated design and they're covered in ads and the writing style in most news sites is, it's very repetitive. Um, the stories are, like, you know, cite the headline, then embellish on the headline a little bit, and then recite the headline with a little bit more embellishment, et cetera, et cetera. And it's difficult to just, like, get the nut of what's the story out of that. But for a while, I've had an app on my phone, installed on my phone, called Circa, Circa News. And on the face of it, it's just a really beautifully designed app for reading news. But the real power of it is that they've got an editorial team, which basically takes, aggregates news from other sources. And they write uh, nutshell versions for this app that kind of distill the story down to the essentials. And and they're not really removing information in my experience. It's more that they're just sort of removing the the repetition and the fluff that goes on in most news writing. And they also they like cite the sources for each story and you can like follow stories. If there's something particularly interesting, you can follow it and it'll update you as as more information comes in. It'll actually show you like here's the part that was updated. Here's the the part that was added rather than you having having to read the whole thing again. Um so really well executed. Circa news. And that's it for me. Very nice. I like how last year you could tell an awful headline because it began with, you know, doctors hate her. You could tell that it led to a scam. And now all of the news sites are using like three or four headline templates. And the one that, oh my God, yes. The one that makes me the angriest is you won't believe what happens next. (laughs) I closed my browser. That's what happens next. That's what happens (laughs) next. Yes. I won't find out what happens next. Cool. So I have some picks. Um, so the first one, because Avdi reminded me when he did his beer pick, I'd like to do my first food pick. It was also a very important moment in my life. Last week, I bought my first pumpkin, and I felt very American. Um, I was born in Ethiopia, so that actually means something. And I tweeted it, and I said, you know, I bought my first pumpkin. This is so cool. And everyone replied and said, oh, that's really neat. Are you going to carve it? And I was like, no, I'm not going to carve it. I'm going to eat it. <laughs> so I baked it, and then I ate it. So um, everyone should buy a pumpkin and eat it. Wait, you can eat pumpkin? Read. You can do- <laughs> <laughs> I cut it in half, and then I took the seeds out, and then I baked it for an hour, and then I sprinkled um, Chinese five spice, because I didn't have any cinnamon, and honey, and walnuts, and then I just like ate it with a spoon. It was amazing. Okay, nice. I want to I want to challenge your functional fixedness here a little bit, Saran. Uh oh. <laughs> Given a pumpkin and a knife and a candle, decorate. Your- <laughs> <laughs> I think she just challenged everyone else's functional fixedness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just exactly. You can eat that. Surprise! I know it was crazy. I told did my mom. I did. did I did not. The seeds? This, okay, so this is the thing, right? I have the seeds. I'm actually looking at them. They're in a bowl. I knew that I could eat them too somehow, but I didn't know what to do, so I just kept them in a bowl. And I guess I should do something with that. Well, I, I don't like have it off the top of my head, but yeah, I totally look up how you roast them. I, I think you put stuff on them like salt or something, but uh, they're really, really good. Kind okay, of, they're really high in zinc. They're good for you. Nice. So my second one um, kind of relates to our conversation today. So it's a blog post called Fixed Mindset versus Growth Mindset. And it's a really short read, but it's a really good reminder of just the the two different ways to kind of think about your skills and your abilities. So the fixed mindset says, you know, I am not creative. I am not a creative person. And the growth mindset says, I can learn to be creative. And I feel like that's really, really important. And it's been really, really important for me as a programmer because I never, ever, ever, ever would have thought of myself as a programmer. And I had to internalize the idea of, no, I can learn how to do this as a skill. So I feel like no matter what it is that you're approaching and you're trying to do, understanding the difference and zoning in and focusing on your growth mindset, I think is really important. So that's my pick. The other one is really, really cool. It's the spinning RGB LED ball two. And the link that I'm going to include is both a video of it, and then it also teaches you how to build it. And it's supposed to be really, really hard to do. 
but it's this incredible thing. I'm not sure how to describe it. It's like this wooden kind of arc thing, and it has these three lasers on these three axes, and it spins and makes the most incredibly beautiful, mind-blowing shapes and designs, and it's just, oh my god, it's absolutely incredible. I have no idea why you would have it, other than to just, you know, get your friends to do an awe, but it's it's awesome, so I wanted you guys to check that out. Um, and the last pick that I have is the Code Newbie Discourse page, which I'm really excited about, and I'm sure that by the time this um, this airs, it'll be launched, but uh, I've kind of been inspired by Parlay for Ruby Rogue, so I've built uh, you know, discourse for the Code Newbie podcast. And so if you are interested in supporting Code Newbies or if you are a Code Newbie, I would love for you to get on and share some of your resources and stuff. So those are my picks. Very cool. I've got a couple of picks, books. Big surprise, right? I always pick books. The first one is, I picked it a couple of weeks ago, but I just want to reiterate it, um, is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. I'm actually tempted to start a study group for it if you're interested in business and that kind of thing because I thought it was really good. And the other pick I have is just uh, exercise. Just get out and be active. I've been running, and I love it. it. I just feel so good afterward, and I've been feeling a lot better lately than I have for a while. Yeah, so those are my picks. We'll wrap up the show. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we'll catch you all next week. A special thanks to HoneyBadger.io for sponsoring Ruby Rogues. They do exception monitoring, uptime, and performance metrics, and are an active part of the Ruby community. This episode is sponsored by Mad Glory. You've been building software for a long time, and sometimes it gets a little overwhelming. Work piles up, hiring sucks, and it's hard to get projects out the door. Check out Mad Glory. They're a small shop with experience shipping big products. They're smart, dedicated, will augment your team, and work as hard as you do. Find them online at madglory.com or on Twitter at madglory. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Would you like to join a conversation with the rogues and their guests? Want to support the show? We have a forum that allows you to join the conversation and support the show at the same time. You can sign up at rubyrogues.com slash parlor.